Dr. Dick Davis, who is the chair uh, of the Department of uh, Near Eastern Languages and Culture. He's done a lot of extensive research in um, his, Persian, his books, poems, all related to uh, Persian translations. And they're fascinating. So I mean, I know everyone's going to enjoy it. I'd like to introduce Dr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Should I stand up? Can you? Um, no response. Did you hear that? Sorry? He's very nice to peace theater. <laughs> That's not necessarily a good thing. It could mean that one of us, the lights are out, one of us will be, be dead when the lights come up again. <laughs> In that case, the librarian did it. It's always the librarian. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to read um, I'm going to read mainly my verse translations from Persian and I translate almost all the verse I've translated is medieval Persian I've translated a little modern Persian prose but what I'm really interested in is medieval Persian poetry and I'm going to spend most of my time reading verse translations from medieval Persian poems. Little short poems and some extracts from some longer poems. Actually from one longer poem, probably. <clears throat> I'm going to start with some very tiny poems indeed from a book I published a long time ago now, about 15 years ago, called Borrowed Ware, um, which is, the, 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 the title is taken from a medieval manuscript Actually, I'll read, I'll read the little poem that it's in. It's a medieval uh, English manuscript, if I can find it. Um, and it, it gives you why I called the book Borrowed Ware. This is an anonymous poem. We don't know who it's by. It's from a, uh, a manuscript of Tudor poetry called the Harrington Manuscript of Tudor Poetry, which was actually edited by somebody at Ohio State in the 1920s, I think. Lo, here I show this slender work and bear, in which the pain but not the praise is mine like grapes that grew upon another's vine, and happily in the gathering bruised are. I cannot boast, but as of borrowed ware, though grape be good, the press may mar the wine, and make it sour before it should be fine. To please your taste, I did it first prepare, with higher wits and works, I not compare. It's a very awkward poem, but it's somebody saying, I'm gonna give you a translation, it's somebody else's work, really, but I've done my best which is why I call this book Borrowed Well. Now these poems are epigrams and they go by very quickly indeed. So if you, if you blink, they're gone, <clears throat> or most of them. The first one is only two lines long, and it's by a poet called Amare, who lived at the end of the 10th and the beginning of the 11th century. We know very little about him, but this, this poem actually is not a poem, it's a fragment of a longer poem. The longer poem is lost. This couplet is quoted in an anthology, or a kind of book of connoisseurship that was put together long after Amare was dead. And it became very famous. <clears throat> so it's just a couple of them. I'll hide within my poems as I write them, hoping to kiss your lips as you recite them. Isn't that charming? <laughs> <laughs> or slightly icky, I don't know. <laughs> this is a poem by Sanai, who's a 12th century mystical poet. Again, it's a very short poem, and this poem is very, very slight in Persian. There's almost nothing there, but it's a poem I've always found very haunting. When you see the poem on the page, I think you can see immediately what it's about, but just hearing it, you might think, what was that about? So I'll tell you what it's about. It's about living in the world. It's about being here in the world. It's four lines. If I could choose to come, I'd not have come. If I could choose to go, when would I go? The best would be if I had never come and were not here and did not have to go. <clears throat> this is a poem, this is the longest poem from this book I'm going to read. It's by a poet called Nasa Khosro, who was an 11th century poet. This poem is a riddle. Usually when I read this poem, there's somebody in the audience who, who gets the riddle. Sometimes there isn't, so let's, let's see. see if somebody can get the riddle. <clears throat> a riddle. It's about 
18 lines up. I have a friend who, when I'm all alone, sits with me. And how intimate we've grown. He talks, but what he says he never hears. He is unfeeling, but he dries my tears. He has one book. He has a hundred faces, as lovely as the spring in desert places. Sometimes I thump him on the back. I must. He gets half smothered in thick, choking dust. He talks, but soundlessly. He has to find a clever man before he'll speak his mind. Whenever I encounter him, his eyes recall the precepts of the good and wise. And yet he's quiet till I look his way, unlike some fools who blather on all day. In darkness he falls silent, which is right. He is a prince who glories in the light. Any offers? I know that one person here knows. No? No, 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 no. Could be, but it isn't. It's fire. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to get it. The fire's on the fire. No. It's a book. Thank you. Well done. Well done. It's a book. It's a book. Shall I read it again when you can see it's a book? Yes. All right. Quickly. I have a friend who, when I'm all alone, sits with me. And how intimate we've grown. He talks, but what he says he never hears. He is unfeeling, but he dries my tears. He has one back, he has a hundred faces. As lovely as the spring in desert places. Sometimes I thump him on the back, I must. He gets half smothered in thick choking dust. All librarians know that. He talks, but soundlessly. He has to find a clever man before he'll speak his mind. Whenever I encounter him, his eyes recall the precepts of the good and wise. And yet he's quiet till I look his way. Unlike some fools who blather on all day, in darkness he falls silent, which is right. He is a prince who glories in the light. It's a book. I'll read a couple of poems that go together because of their poets going together. This poet is called Amar, and he was the poet laureate at a very small provincial court in the 12th century. Uh, and this is his poem. It's not much of a poem. I'm reading you this poem because I want to read the poem by Ahmad's friend slash enemy, friend, which comes next. This is a very typical kind of poem from this period. <clears throat> Love makes me wish that everyone were blind and only I could see you and reveal you. Or that my own two eyes were blind and then I would not see the others hovering near you. Now, Amag, as I said, was poet laureate. And there was another poet at the court called Rashidi, at the same court. And one day the prince asked Amag, what do you think of Rashidi's poems? I think they're pretty good. This put Amag in the spot on spot, because if Amag said they're terrible, he would be criticizing the prince's taste, which is not a good thing to do in this kind of court. On the other hand, if he said, oh, they're wonderful, then the prince might replace him, Amag, with Rashidi as his poet laureate. So Amag took sort of, um, he, he hedged his bets. He said, well, they're very good. They're very, they're very um, accurate, and they follow all the rules, but they have no salt. They, they, they're, they're saltless. They're insipid. And Rashidi wrote this poem in answer to Amar. You say my verse lacks salt. Perhaps it's true. My verse is sweet as sugar cane and honey, and salt should not be added to these two. Look, pimp. Salt's good for beans and turnip stew, the kind of muck served up as verse by you. <laughs> I'll read a couple of poems by Masati, who's a, a woman poet of the 12th century. There are three famous women poets of medieval Iran, and one of them I'm going to read quite a lot from later. Um, Masati, it's been suggested recently that Masati never actually existed, that she's a kind of invention of later anthologists. Um, I don't know whether she existed or not, uh, um, but there are a number of poems ascribed to her. They're all love poems, and they're either very plaintive love poems, which is very typical for the period, and I'll read one of those, or they're kind of rather witty, flippant love poems, and I'll read one of those. First, the plaintive one. This is a very famous poem in Persian, and it's extremely beautiful in Persian. 
This is a poem about how you're so awful to me and I hate you and I can't live without you. It's one of those poems. <clears throat> the one your beauty's overthrown has come back home. The one who thirsts for you alone has come back home. Prepare the cage again. Scatter your seeds of kindness there. Look, broken winged, the bird you own has come back home. Or on my city. Here's one that's typical of the other side of Masati. This is obviously to a lover for whom she didn't have much respect. You're no great intellect, and men like you don't know the usual kindnesses a lover ought to show. My flighty friend, I'm glad I'm with you here tonight. I hope I don't regret it in the morning, though. <coughs> um, Another poet, poem by a woman poet, Ayeshe Samagandhi, of whom we know nothing except that she, presumably she was from Samarkand, as her name suggests. She's from the 13th century, and that's the extent of what we know about her. There are three poems attributed to her in an anthology of short poems from the 14th century. This is one of them. My hated love, last night and all night too, they, cursed them, told me stories about you. Their gossip was, you break your promises. And you know what? My heart said, yes, it's true. This is a poem by Afzal ad-Din, who's a religious poet. I'll read a couple of poems by him. In both cases, the him in the poems is God. Those close to him make little of the fact. His is a name they almost never mention. The windy ones who screech like fights live far from him. That's why they're screeching, for attention. And another poem which is also about the hymn as God. Whatever images appear are images of him who gave those images existence here. The sea's depths rise, men say, a wave. Each new wave in reality is nothing but the ancient sea. That image of, the, of God as the sea, that, which throws up new appearances the whole time, is a very common image in medieval poetry. <coughs> poem by Rumi, probably the most famous Persian medieval poet in the West now, in the most execrable translations, but we won't go into that. Um, <coughs> actually, there are some good ones now, um, particularly by um, Mojad Dedi, who's an Afghani who is doing a translation of Rumi's long poem, the Masnavi, for Oxford University Press, and it's extremely good. It's a good English verse, and it's very accurate to the Persian. This is a very short poem by Rumi. It's not a mystical poem, in fact. The nights I spend with you, love will not let me sleep. The nights I lie alone, I lie awake and weep. With you or without you, God knows I stay awake. But look what different forms a sleepless night can take. Um, perhaps that's enough of those. Oh yes, one, um, one more. This a poet called Ibn Yamin. This guy too is a religious poet. He's from the um, early 14th century, first half of the 14th century. And he's a lovely poet. He's not terribly well known. But I really like his poems very much. They're very gentle. They're not sort of... Uh, angry in their religious attitude. This is one of his poems. <clears throat> to profit from this world and from religion, know that the heart of both is man's benevolence. To seek the rights and comfort of the poor will equal any self-denying ordinance. And if there is a key to heaven's gate, it's kindness and a lack of all malevolence. Most of the Persian medieval poets lived by writing panegyrics, praise poems to people with money, the king or a prince or a vizier or an ambassador or a courtier of some kind. And these praise poems are called panegyrics. <clears throat> and of course, the poets were always on the lookout to get somebody to pay them to write a panegyric. This poem begins with what's a very conventional way of opening a poem in Persian, medieval Persian, which is you ask the wind, the breeze, 
to take a message from you to the person you want to address. I'm going to read some poems by Hafiz later on, and a couple of his poems begin with that same trope. This is by a poet called Vashi, who lived in the 16th century. Sweet breeze, inform my noble lord from me that panegyrics are what I excel at. And if he gets obstreperous and rude, say satire is also something I do well at. <laughs> um, I'm going to read one anonymous poem, then we'll move on from these. <clears throat> this is anonymous. It was collected in an anthology put together in 1330, so we know it's before 1330, and that's all we know. In this, po this poem is about a, an old-fashioned scale where you put the thing you were weighing in one pan and then you put the weight in the other pan and when they were equal, when they were sort of horizontal on the same level, and then you had the right weight. So it's, it's that kind of thing. The world's a scale where men are weighed. The worse they are, the more they boast. But that's the way that scales are made. The emptier pans, the uppermost. That's nice. <laughs> 